welcome from Senator Rothbard. I just showed Jazz my double and button. <laughs> the, uh, the Irish roots are coming out tonight. Uh, listen, thank you all so much for having me tonight. It's fun to see everybody. A lot of great friends in the room and um, a lot of folks who worked their heart out in this last election for a different result. Uh, we didn't succeed, but it wasn't for lack of effort and it wasn't for lack of a lot of phone calls and a lot of door to door and a lot of talks to your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers about the different direction you wanted to take this country. It didn't work out. But it doesn't mean that we give up. In fact, it means we got to work all the harder. We've got to get ourselves up, dust ourselves off, do things differently. We can't keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. We've got to change our tactics. We've got to change who we use the grassroots, the technology we use. We've got to go online. We've got to have a clearer message. Uh, we've got to have candidates who, across the board, or let people know that the Republican Party is the party of jobs and opportunity and growth and inclusion. You agree with me? Yeah. Um, but I, I, I love to hear at this club, and it's it's you know it's terrific for Franklin County that there are uh, people in Dublin who are willing to step forward and to help other Republicans get elected and to gather like this and talk about the issues. Dublin's a great city. It's an example of a place in Ohio that you know is doing all the right things. It's a good place to live, a good place to work, it's a safe place, it's a place where entrepreneurs can see their dreams fulfilled. Thanks to John Kasich, the state of Ohio is a better place to see your dreams being fulfilled. I walked in and uh, saw Jim Hughes standing up here. Jim's always been real involved in my campaigns. I've been helpful to him. He's a guy who gets it. He wants pro-growth policies. He wants to be sure that people on the bottom rung can get to the second rung and the third rung here in Ohio, and that's why he supported, as did the other members of the legislature who have seen here tonight. I saw Bob Hackett coming in. I think Mike Duffy's here somewhere. Duffy, there you are. Uh, I hope I'm probably going to miss somebody here. Is, is Stephanie here? Stephanie Kunze? Yeah. Where are you, Stephanie? Is she here? Well, Stephanie and I were at the uh, Ohio State Gophers game last week together. That was a good one. For those of you who saw that basketball game, that was after the big uh, loss to Wisconsin and before the win at Michigan State. And the Buckeyes were back on their game. So, uh, oh, wait. All right. I'm thinking we're in the tournament. I'm thinking we're a little, we, we bloom late in Ohio sometimes. That's all I can say. But, Got to get some more scores, and uh, I think we're going to be just fine in the tournament. But anyway, all those guys have worked hard together with John Kasich to do something really simple balance the budget without raising taxes. By acknowledging that there's enough revenue coming in, the problem is we've got to get the spending under control. In Ohio, it was an $8 billion hole. Unfortunately, at the federal government level, it's about $8 billion a day. I mean, literally, we're looking at $100 billion a month now in deficits. It's, it's incredible, a trillion dollars a year. $17 trillion almost now is the debt that's been racked up from all these deficits. But here in Ohio, uh, you know, we had a significant deficit compared to our budget, $8 billion. And what Governor Casey said was, you know what, we're not going to just raise taxes. <laughs> we're going to close this without raising taxes. In fact, we're going to actually reduce some taxes to make Ohio a better place to work and to create more jobs and opportunities for people who are struggling to, to get ahead. That's what we ought to be doing in Washington, D.C. It's not that complicated. Um, is Mary Lowe here tonight? I heard Mary was going to be here. The flag lady? Okay, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Okay, our prayers go out to Mary. She's in the hospital, I just heard. The reason I was going to give her a hard time is because there's such a small flag here behind me. Normally with Mary, the flag is about three stories tall as it was for that rally with Mitt Romney at the end of the campaign. Wasn't that an incredible rally? Incredible energy. And thanks so many of you for helping put that together. So I just uh, left a couple Lincoln Day events today. One was a Lincoln Day lunch in Crawford County. I was just in Marion County at their dinner. And so Lincoln's on my mind. Some of you might have watched the Academy Awards. It was really great to see all these liberal Democrats talking about how great Abraham Lincoln was. I love that. 
But you know what kind of went over their heads? It was the fact that what they were doing was they were praising a president who happened to be our first Republican president, who also, also happened as the 16th president of the United States to be a leader, in contrast to our current president. <laughs> You know, I mean, the whole movie was about making tough decisions, wasn't it? And it was about reaching across the aisle, working with other people to get something done. You know, and it wasn't easy. The guy had big obstacles. And that was about a fundamental issue. It was about slavery. I'm not saying there's a comparable issue today. But I would tell you, our country's in trouble. It's in trouble again, and it's both these fiscal problems that we talked about a second ago. The debt is now $130,000 per household in Ohio. Think about that. The average income in Ohio, average family, their share of the national debt is now 130,000 bucks. That's a great present to leave to the future generation, isn't it? It's affecting our economy today, and it's immoral to do for the future. But it's also our, our growth, our economic growth. Look, Ohio, thanks to Republican policies, is a little ahead of the nation. But we're not satisfied with these high unemployment rates. We certainly shouldn't be. We're, we're, we're working through the weakest economic recovery in the history of our country. And think about that. After the 1982 recession, some of you lived through that. You remember it was pretty deep. In fact, the unemployment number was higher than it was in this most recent recession. So was the interest rate. So was the inflation. You might remember Jimmy Carter. Uh, well, what happened? Ronald Reagan came in and he did kind of the opposite of what President Obama is doing. He showed leadership. And he said, you know, we're not going to grow the size and scope of government. We're actually going to reduce the size of government and we're going to make the private sector stronger. Uh, I was just in Marion County, as I said, and Marion County, you know, celebrates Harding. So it's a Harding day, so I found a Harding quote today. It was pretty good for Harding. It was, uh, you know, there's too much government in business, and there's not enough business in government. That was Warren G. Harding. Pretty good, huh? Uh, so this is what, this is what uh, America can see. State of Ohio, an example. Ronald Reagan comes in in the 80s. What happened then? Well, we had a steep economic recovery. It was, it was a, a real recovery in the sense that we brought back jobs and growth. At this point, after this recession, unfortunately, the economy's flat. We're still down over 3 million jobs. So the economy still hasn't brought back over 3 million jobs. That's 3 million families in Ohio and elsewhere who do not have the economic opportunity we want everybody to have. In the 1980s, under Ronald Reagan, at this point, after that recession, you know what had happened? America had brought back over 7 million new jobs. That's what I call a real recovery. That's what I call a Republican recovery. Because it was based on the time-honored principles that have made this country great and have made us this beacon of hope and opportunity for the rest of the world, which is an America that does value hard work and enterprise and risk-taking. And America says we do want the people who are at the bottom end of the economic ladder to be able to climb up. And the best way to give them that hope is by creating a job and making it possible for them and their family to have the dignity and self-respect that comes with the job. I, I was with some farmers today and they were asking me about why I didn't support the Farm Bill last time. Well, because the Farm Bill is mostly now, over 80% of it, food stamps and other government programs that the Agriculture Department administers. And those programs weren't reformed at all. In fact, spending was increased and it actually broke through some of the caps that we just gave last year on the on this budget control act that's led to the sequester and so on so i said i voted against it and really when you think about it the way democrats so often determine whether someone is getting ahead is you know whether they're able to have access to these programs so if you judge compassion by how many people get on food stamps which is 15 million more people in the last four years, then things are going pretty well. But as Republicans, we judge compassion by how many people can get off food stamps and get on to a job, don't we? That's the big difference. That's the big difference. Talking about the movie Lincoln, uh, I went to a speech recently in Washington, D.C., and uh, Henry Kissinger spoke. Henry Kissinger is still alive, for those of you who are wondering. <laughs> And for some folks in the room, younger people, you may not remember this, Henry Kissinger was Secretary of State, he was National Security Advisor, he was everything in the Nixon administration, and he's still a, you know, a really wise counselor on foreign policy issues. He was talking, and he was talking like he always does like this. <laughs> he, he said, uh, somebody asked me whether I had seen Lincoln. <laughs> I said, 
Not since 1860. <laughs> the focus pretty good. Uh, but, you know, again, Lincoln, think of this movie, think of what Lincoln did. Think of Lincoln's, think of Lincoln's great quotes. One is, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Which he paraphrased from the Gospels. But it's, you know, sort of the American story. A house divided against itself cannot stand. We want to bring America together to solve problems. That's how we have succeeded. That's how we got through a Great Depression, two world wars, and became, again, the envy of the world in terms of the great middle class that we built. And when I think of what this president has done since his election, it's just the opposite. Instead of saying a house divided against itself cannot stand, he's saying let's continue to divide this country into different groups, Republicans, Democrats, rich, poor. For the last couple months, instead of working with members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, what's the president been doing? He's been campaigning. <laughs> it's like the campaign never ended. I mean, I, I think he's logged 5,000 miles, that's what I'm told. I don't know what that cost per mile is, but it's probably pretty expensive for all those taxpayers. But more importantly, maybe instead of those 5,000 miles around the country, the mile down to the capital would make sense. Again, let's at least start with working with Democrat leaders and saying, you know, what is the alternative to this sequester? Here's what the Republicans have said. One, at a time of historic debts and deficits, the last thing we can do is go back on the commitment we made more than a year and a half ago to have these spending reductions occur. We have to do this for our economy today and for the future of our kids and grandkids. To say we're not going to keep our commitment to make these spending cuts? Does that make any sense? So the president said, no, this is, it's too much to do. We're going to do half of it in terms of tax increases. We said, no, no, it's, these are spending cuts. We, we just raised $620 billion of taxes. Um, secondly, we've said to the president, you know, if the sequester is going to go into effect, it's going to be across the board, mostly out of defense, about 50% of it comes from 16% of the budget, which is the part of defense that's subject to that. We don't like that. We don't like the fact that it's across the board, even across discretionary spending, because we think that we should be prioritizing spending. We've got to make those savings, but let's do it in a smarter way. So, Mr. President, we'll provide you the flexibility to be able to find these cuts in the entire budget. If you do that, the budget's, by the way, $3.6 trillion. That means that the cuts will be somewhere between 2 and 3%. Now, tell me in this room, anybody who's in business, and for that matter in your family budget, who hasn't had to tighten their belts 2 to 3% in the last four years? I was in a business group yesterday and today, and I asked that question, and both times, yesterday was with a big business group, you know, major CEOs of major companies. They had the same reaction that the small business owners did today when I was in Crawford County asking that question, which is, they all raised their hand, every one of them. So there's plenty of examples of waste, fraud, and abuse in the government. If we spread it out responsibly and allow it to be done on a prioritized basis, it would not only make a lot of sense for our country, it would be something that wouldn't result in all of the parade of horribles that the president has laid out, many of which are exaggerated, we find out. But he doesn't have to do it that way. But when that vote came up yesterday to say, okay, let's find the cuts across the budget, let's give you the flexibility, Mr. President, to find those reductions in <coughs> examples of waste and cut administrative costs, deal with some of these procurements that are out of hand, reduce spending in places where everybody knows you can do it, including, by the way, the President, since his own budget last year found almost $500 billion of what they call consolidations and other savings. What did the President say? No. No, no. no. I, I, he sort of enjoys blaming it on Republicans. <laughs> and so he says, no, you know, we need to have this tax increase and we need to you know, do it our way and uh, and blame Republicans. Now, I, you know, there's this big battle now with Bob Woodward. I don't know if you followed this at all, but Bob Woodward, you know, no friend of Republicans, let's be honest. Yeah. Uh, Especially Yeah, I mean, he's a Watergate Bob Woodward, but he's a, you know, he's a good reporter. He goes for the facts and he spent a lot of time studying what happened with this Budget Control Act that ended up with sequester, that ended up with the Super Committee, that this exhaustive interviews, I was part of it because I was a member of the super committee, which ended up being not so super. Uh, and I'm still glad that I you know, was there to make an effort, and I took it very seriously and tried, but we weren't able to get there. But anyway, Bob Woodward says, you know, the president's people actually proposed the sequester. That's certainly how I remember it. 
Now, that to me, that's not really all that relevant. We are where we are. We should be working through these problems together, solving these problems. Again, like we've done here in the state of Ohio. But it is sort of tough to sit there and hear the president say time and time again, it's somebody else's fault. You know, Abraham Lincoln didn't say it's somebody else's fault. He said a house divided against itself will fall. Let's come together as a country. And you saw that in the movie. Let's show leadership and make tough decisions and be willing to stand up and be counted. Tonight I was uh, watching TV at a bar. Okay, it was a bar. <laughs> it was, uh, I went into a tavern on the way to the Marion County uh, Harding Day litter, dinner because it was uh, a tavern in uh, Waldo, Ohio. They had this big sign outside that some of you have probably seen it saying, World Famous Bologna Sandwiches. <laughs> and, uh, the GNR Tavern in Waldo, Ohio. And I couldn't help myself, so we pulled up the pickup truck, went in there. I didn't have my coat and tie on, uh, which was good. And um, so I was sitting at the bar waiting for my bologna sandwich, which was delicious. If you haven't had this thing, it's not all like the bologna sandwiches I remember growing up, like the bologna is this thick. But <laughs> I'm watching TV, and I'm watching Columbus News, and uh, I don't know if you saw it tonight, but they had David Gregory was on, kind of wringing his hands about, oh, the sequester and all that's going to happen. And, and then they had the president's news conference, and, and apparently one of the reporters asked him, you know, why didn't you just lock the door and have a budget negotiation right there with the Republican leadership? They were right there. You know what his response was? Well, he said to the American people, Speaker Boehner and Mitch McConnell uh, had planes to cash, had, had planes to cash, and so, you know, I couldn't get the Secret Service to stop them. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's sort of like, I want to work with these guys, you probably have to say something like, you know, that wasn't the right time maybe to negotiate the budget, but I do want to work with them in the future, rather than saying, kind of, their fault. You know, they told me they had planes to catch. Well, folks, maybe the president said to them, let's stay here and negotiate this thing out. I doubt it. <laughs> He's had a couple months to do that. And, uh, you know, I think they got one phone call. And so I, I, I'm not suggesting that this is all about who did what in the past. I'm saying here, here's, here's where we are. And where we are is, as a country, in trouble. We're in trouble because of the historic debt for deficits we talked about. We're in trouble because of the weak economy. And without a growing economy, we can't deal with the first problem. And by the way, it's related the other way, too. We're not going to see a strong economic recovery until we put pro-growth policies in place on tax reform, on entitlement reform, on energy reform, on regulatory reform, on things to actually help businesses get out from under the heavy hand of government. In other words, you need to deal with the debt and deficit in order to give people like many in this room who are business people the confidence to invest and to bring back the jobs. That's what I hear all over. I heard it again from the big business guys yesterday and the small business people today. So these are problems that we face not as Republicans or Democrats. We face these problems as Americans. And let's do harken back to Lincoln. He said something else was interesting. Some of you may know that in one of his speeches he said something that was I think, prophetic for today. He said, if danger ever reach us, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. That's been misquoted sometimes to say that if America ever falls, America will fall from within. But that's essentially what he meant. He went on to say, because I've looked up this quote, that as free men and free women, no one's going to take us down from abroad. The greatest armies in Europe tried that. And, and you know, they thought for sure they could keep us under their thumb, and then they thought they could get us in 1812, and then, you know, other countries have taken us on. Free men and free women will not be defeated from without. Uh, but from within, we need to be very careful, because if we continue down the road we're on, irresponsibly building up these debts and deficits, not dealing with our problems, allowing the politics of the day to trump the good policies we know we must put in effect for our future, uh, we could be crumbling from within. I think we're in trouble already. I think we've got to address these problems. You hired me to get something done. I'm a conservative. I'm a proud conservative. I will also reach across the aisle work with anybody who's willing to address these problems. 
I will not support stuff that I don't believe in. And when the president proposes taxes, after this huge tax increase, the biggest in American history at the first of the year, uh, I can't support that. By the way, the tax that the president wanted to put into this sequester that he's going around the country talking about, he calls the Buffett tax. Have you heard this? This is the Buffett tax. What is it really? It's really a tax on capital gains, because the people who are that high bracket who don't pay at least, what is it, 30% have a lot of capital gains income. That's why, for the most part. And on a lot of small businesses that are successful small businesses. Now, they happen to employ a lot of people. They're not a number of small businesses that are that successful, but if they are, uh, they're good businesses. You don't want to tax them because they're going to take the money right out of their plant equipment and their people. So I've had my team do a little analysis of it yesterday. I said, well, you know, if this tax were to go into effect, um, and you assume that there's going to be some negative impact on the economy because when you raise the capital gains tax, you're going to have some impact on the economy. How much revenue is really going to come in? Here are the numbers. If the president's tax increase were to be put into effect and the economy were to grow only one fiftieth of one percent less because of this new tax, only one fiftieth of one percent less, there would be no revenue coming to the federal government. In other words, it's one of these tax increases that is politics. It sounds good, but the reality is it's not going to raise any revenue because it's going to have an impact on the economy. Economists will differ on how much, but I don't think there's an economist who's going to tell you that it's not going to have at least one fiftieth of one percent hit on the economy. And there are people in this room who get capital gains income, and the reason that John Kennedy and Bill Clinton and Republican presidents over the year have supported a lower rate for capital gains is because you want to encourage investment and savings and people to create jobs, right? So, I had planned to get into that level of detail, but I think you deserve to know, you know, what the actual choices are. <coughs> and what we as Republicans need to stand for is not talking about necessarily all the details of this, but to let people know we're not trying to protect rich people. We're trying to protect the ability for the guy who's trying to get ahead, the, the woman, the single mom with a kid in Franklin County who's trying to keep the current job she has and maybe improve herself to be able to keep that job or to find a better job, to be able to have a little slice of the American dream. That's what we're about. And what's currently being done in Washington is making it harder, not easier for that to happen. And the proof is in this weak economic recovery. It's not going to get better until we get back to the principles that, again, have made this country that beacon of hope and opportunity for the rest of the world. So that's why we're here tonight. Thank you for what you do for your communities, for your state, and for our great country. Do not give up hope. There was a poll taken on the day Barack Obama was elected president here in Ohio and around the country. And the poll asked people basically, is government too big or too small? Here was the question. Do you believe government is doing too many things better left to businesses and individuals? Or do you believe that government should do more? 51% of Americans said government's doing too many things better left to individuals and businesses. Here in Ohio, that number wasn't 51%. It was 56%. We haven't lost the philosophical battle. I think the American spirit is strong. I think the entrepreneurial spirit is strong. I think people still understand that you're not going to grow jobs and economic growth through government. You're going to do it by creating the opportunity for the private sector to do what they've always done in this country, which is to create this beacon of hope, opportunity to make America, again, the country that every other country in the world looks to for inspiration. As Ronald Reagan used to call it, the shining city on the hill. Thank you. God bless. Thank you very much, Senator. We certainly appreciate you being here. As a matter of fact, we would like to give you an honorary membership to the Dublin Republican Club. <laughs> and you are going to get card number 001. <laughs> now, now, I, have to 
to let you know that this I'm is only boxes. I need to know. <laughs> it's only good for this year. It has to be renewed on an annual basis. <laughs> so maybe have you back here again next year.